Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Uh, always like to start by noting where guardians are joining us. And we've got people from all over the country, uh, New Hampshire, Virginia, uh, the state of Washington, and of course, uh, throughout the Rocky Mountains in the West. And so I also saw that we have uh, a member or a supporter from Indonesia joining us. Today. So that's exciting. Um, fire's a, a global topic, so there's a global audience here. Um, in these Wild Earth webinars, uh, we try to bring together national issue experts and people from frontline communities, elected officials, and oftentimes Wild Earth Guardian staff too, to talk about critical issues at a critical time. And as always too, our purpose is to inform inspire and activate guardians like you to confront and address the challenges of our times. Um, we like to take questions. So I'll take one or two about halfway through and then as many as we get uh, in the last five to 10 minutes of this webinar. Today we'll be talking about um, a hot topic, fire and forest ecology in the American West. With me today to discuss these matters are Monica Bond. Monica's a, a wildlife biologist and biodiversity advocate with the Wild Nature Institute. She's also a research associate uh, with the University of Zurich. She's published more than 45 peer reviewed scientific journal articles and book chapters. And she spent the last two decades studying spotted owls. Uh, she served on the Dry Forest Landscapes Working Group for the Northern Spotted Owl Recovery Plan. She travels around the world, lucky you, Monica, researching and advocating for the conservation of imperiled wildlife and their habitats. So welcome to you, Monica. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and then also joining us is Chad Hansen. He's a research ecologist and director of the John Muir Project of Earth Island Institute, located in Big Bear City, California. Uh, Dr. Hansen has a PhD in ecology with a research focus on fire ecology in conifer forest ecosystems. He just published a book, congratulations. It's entitled Smokescreen, Debunking Wildfire Myths to Save Our Forests and Our Climate. He's also a, a co-author and co-editor of a 2015 book about fire and it's entitled The Ecological Importance of Mixed Severity Fires, Nature's Phoenix. It's great to have you, Chad. Thank you, great to be here. Yeah, so I am always excited about these conversations, but after talking uh, recently with both of you to prep for this call, I'm just, I find myself just more excited than normal because this is um, it's just a fascinating topic. So I wanted to start by asking each of you um, how you come to this work of essentially being professional pyromaniacs. And I say that with respect to all the, the hard work and credibility you bring to it, but obviously playfully as well, knowing that in each of us, there's a little a little pyromaniac. So why don't you start first, Monica, what's your journey to, to these issues? Yeah, okay, great. So um, I would say that my first, I remember my first hike in a burn forest was in Eastern Oregon, um, back in the sort of early mid 1990s. And that was the first time I had really, really saw what, what a burn forest was all about. And I, I was just blown away by the life that was thriving there and actually quite surprised because I, I hadn't known that, um, that there was so much life in a burned forest. And then a little after that, um, Congress passed the salvage rider, maybe some of you remember that, um, where there was sort of expedited, we called it lawless logging, um, it expedited logging in, uh, in, uh, of, of, of dead trees basically. You know, you could salvage log those trees without having to follow the usual environmental regulations. And um, you know, people were up in arms about that. And so I you know, wrote letters against that, um, did a little bit of activism. But then I would say that it, it really became personal to me. I, after I'd been studying spotted owls in the central Sierra Nevada, a little west of 
of Lake Tahoe. I was studying spotted owls there for three years and a fire burned through the study area. And then um, as there wants to do, the Forest Service immediately proposed salvage logging, cutting the trees in that area. And, um, and back then, uh, this was in 2001, the star fire burned. And back then, and Chad, you remember this because we worked on this together, the Forest Service would, would propose to, to, to salvage log or to, to log every tree that even if it was alive and just a little bit burned, you know, even just if it was in a low severity area, if it just had a little fire scar, it was marked for cut. And so Chad and I kind of drove, we're driving around the area and we, we talked to a logger. And I remember this conversation that he said, I understand you guys want to protect the trees that you know, are still alive and green, but what, what about these dead trees? What, what do they matter? And that sort of started me anyway on, that, on the journey of trying to advocate for like, what does it matter if you have these huge burned areas? What, what, kind of, what are we trying to save when we save these forests? And in, in fighting that salvage logging sale, I learned that there really was not very much information about how spotted owls, so I was, I was working as an expert on spotted owls. There wasn't a lot known about how spotted owls use these burned areas. We knew that they could actually uh, continue living in areas that had experienced fire, but we didn't know how they used different burn severities. So that got me thinking that I'd like to do that kind of research. So I did some research on a big fire in Southern California and found that they actually really liked to forage in the high severity burn forest. And that was really groundbreaking at the time, got me excited. And then I kind of continued on with my spotted owl research till then. And actually, um, uh, a few years after I did that, I started working on blackback woodpeckers. And I will put a pin in that because I think we're going to talk more about blackback woodpeckers. But then that really got me like into super, you know, pyrophilic animals. And, and uh, we'll talk about the blackback woodpecker because it's a really, really um, fire loving animal. But that's sort of my journey into, into this work and, and advocating for uh, protecting burn forests because they're so ecologically valuable. Cool. Thanks for sharing. Lovely to see the the pyrophilia in you come out. <laughs> Chad, what about you? What's your, what's your journey to, to being someone who embraces and celebrates fire? Yeah, well, I, I got involved in, in forest protection in general uh, by uh, uh, hiking the Pacific Crest Trail from Mexico to Canada with my older brother uh, back in 1989. And um, I saw the the logging and devastation from logging and clear cutting on public lands uh, from the northern Sierra Nevada all the way up to Canada. And uh, so I decided that that was what I was going to do with my life and, and get involved. And um, and I'd been working on the issue for over a decade. And, uh, and then I met Monica. Uh, and, uh, and that same trip that she described was also foundational for me. Uh, where uh, the logging crew, you know, asked us, you know, the, the foreman of the logging crew asked us, well, you know, what does it matter if we cut down this area of, of, of fire killed trees, you know, it's been destroyed by fire, you know, what, what harm could it possibly cause what species, you know, will be harmed by this, you know, so I thought that was really interesting, Monica and I both, you know, really kind of um, started focusing a lot on, on, the, on the research on this, because not many scientists had even asked that question until that time, I thought it was a really interesting question, you know, at that time, our whole goal was to stop the Forest Service from logging uh, live old growth trees that were very lightly scorched, that uh, they were calling dead and dying, kind of with a wink and a nod. And so Monica and I spent many, many long hours and days documenting these stands where the Forest Service said that there was no green foliage and you know, all the trees had been killed and they were really just you know barely, barely scorched. And, uh, and they were occupied by spotted owls. But we weren't really thinking about the areas that really had been uh, intensely burned, where most or all the trees really had been killed. It wasn't even a thought in our mind, honestly. We were just trying to save the live big old green trees. And, uh, but it occurred to us both after that, that outing that, um, that we were missing something. Amazing. Yep. Just uh, to hear both your stories and the, the personal journey and the, the time spent in the woods is, is clearly a thread that, that ties your journeys to, to understanding fire in the cultural and, and political context for it. Um, I wanted to ask, before we get to talking about the joy and celebrating fire for all its ecological good, um, just a little bit about the historical context for fire. And um, I wonder if each of you could touch briefly on the way in which 
the agencies, whether they're state or federal, how they relate to fire and how that has come to be. A little bit of historical context. You want to go first, Chad? Sure. Well, the 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 agencies like the U.S. Forest Service, for example, um, you know, their their goal for over a century uh, was to eliminate wildfire from the forests. You know, nowadays it's a little more subtle than that. Um, uh, at least in terms of their messaging, but for many decades, their explicit goal was to completely eliminate wildfire from forest ecosystems. Um, they didn't even understand, many of them, that fire was natural, that it had an evolutionary history. Um, a lot of them scoffed at the notion that lightning causes fires because they'd never actually seen uh, it, it happen in front of their eyes. Um, and uh, so, you know, that was the kind of the state of, of, uh, of knowledge or belief back at that time. And of course, they couldn't stop wildfires from burning in our forests. You know, they go back uh, 350 million years in evolutionary history, fire in, in the forests of this planet. And um, and so, you know, more recently, uh, it, it's been it's been a focus on trying to force homogenous, low intensity fire on these ecosystems. Whereas in reality, uh, these forests are all mixed intensity fire uh, uh, regimes. You know, there's differences in terms of the proportion of that mix certainly from ecosystem to ecosystem, but they all have some mix and there's a deep evolutionary history of that. Um, so, uh, but really it comes down to money. The Forest Service uh, you know, didn't like the idea of fire killing trees in areas where they had not yet punched logging roads in uh, and where they didn't have the time to do that before the trees decayed and were no longer usable for lumber. So uh, it was really about economics and politics and frankly today it still is. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, and also, you know, as protections for old growth forests grew and were established, it really sort of shifted to the, the main areas that they would log would be in these post-fire areas. And they became some of the biggest timber sales um, in, you know, at the time then once they once the forest service, it became less popular to, to cut these old growth forests. So they shifted to logging burn forests and it, now it's, it is a huge economic incentive for them to continue to vilify fire and burn forests. And of course, you know, I'm sure everybody on this call has heard of Smokey Bear and knows how incredibly effective that message has been. And so, you know, every, every, every child in America hears of Smokey Bear. So um, they've been very, it's, a, it's been a very powerful, pervasive message. But um, what we're going to learn today on our journey about learning about the, the beauty and, and naturalness and importance of burn forests is that Smokey needs a new message. Doesn't he? Isn't it? Uh... I actually think Smokey's a good pivot point because uh, for us to talk about some of the species that benefit from fire as opposed to this, this public view that, uh, that's been perpetrated by the agency with the Smokey myth that all fires are, are traumatic for wildlife. Um, you know, both of you know um, the University of Montana forest ecologist Dick Hutto and I was sharing that um, I had read the, the story of, um, in a, an article entitled Old Flames, uh, the Tangled History of Forest Fires, Wildlife and People, in which he celebrates the role of these uh, intense fires. Uh, and what I thought was really interesting about it is juxtaposing the agency narrative in which air pollution was horrible, evacuation orders, um, and yet, as he walked through the fire, he said, you couldn't ask for a better fire. What are your thoughts on, on uh, that particular fire and, and, and Dick Hutto's um, reference to this fire not being traumatic, but actually being incredibly beneficial? Yeah, Dick Hutto, um, he, I, I think of him as sort of the godfather of this movement to protect these, these snag forests. He has such a wonderful way with words and everything he says is backed up with science. And so, yeah, when he says you couldn't ask for a better fire and he's in an area which is, you know, you look all around you and it's all uh, blackened trees. It's because at that moment he's hearing blackback woodpeckers, American three-toed woodpeckers, hairy woodpeckers, uh, bluebirds, uh, house wrens. I mean, just countless birds that absolutely thrive in the most severely burned forests. And he, he calls them magical. And I think that's absolutely right. I like to think of them as an ecological treasure trove 
because it's sort of like a treasure that you know you didn't know and you open it up and there you are and you're just blown away by the incredible life that's thriving in these areas and and for me personally when i need to become rejuvenated after i'm sort of feeling depressed about things i go up and i go camping in a burned forest and it, it just reminds me again of, of this you know this the struggle is right that we need to protect these places that um there are so many i mean in fact like Dick Hutto says that almost all bird species in American forests in the West benefit from severe fire at some point in time. So, you know, you, you don't just go there and look a year or two after, but five years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, as the forest regenerates over all that time, different bird species use the forest at different times and, you know, different vegetation types. So the, it's, it's incredibly beneficial. And it's not just birds. There's uh, bats, small mammals, deer, so many other kinds of animals that really do well. Wildflowers that don't even bloom until there's a severe fire. So it really is a magical, magical forest. And I recommend folks go out and see it for yourself. Grab a pair of binoculars after a fire, uh, you know, a year or two. The spring after a fire is always very good. Um, see for yourself. It's beautiful. I love, I love um, that you bring joy to our relationship to fire. I think it's so critical in um, not only talking about the science, the science is, is, is obviously decisions need to be informed by science, but I think one of the challenges in this issue is that our primary relationship to fire as humans is, is fear. Yeah. And so yeah. to bring joy to the experience of a burned landscape is so counter to the narrative that we're taught um, and and that we experience. Let's face it, fires can be scary. Um, what about you, Chad? What's your kind of ecological epiphany about fire and forests and 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 joy? Yeah. Well, I I, I feel the same way as Monica, and she said it very well. But you know, I, I do the same thing. You know, when I uh, my, a good day for me, my best days are, are days in the field, um, hiking in, in the snag forest, um, these, these mature forests that have burned at high intensity where fire is, has killed most or all the trees. You know, obviously, if they have not been subjected to post-fire logging and you see all the natural regeneration, all the wildlife in the snags and the, the regrowing forest and the shrubs and the wildflowers, it's really quite amazing. And um, it's just, it's rich, it's colorful. You have so many flying insects and, um, uh, natural regeneration of the forest, uh, and uh, I think we have some photos that um, that we sent along that you know kind of illustrate some of the, the natural regrowth that are really it's really kind of amazing. Uh, you know, for me, what it's done is it, it's just made me rethink the idea that we've heard so much about you know good fire and bad fire. You know, we hear that narrative a lot. You know, okay, well that was a good fire, and and what people mean by that typically, especially the land management agencies, is uh, it was a fire that burned overwhelmingly at low intensity. And there was almost no high intensity fire. Um, that's actually very rare, but you know, you'll 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 see fires like that sometimes, or they'll do a prescribed burn and they'll say, well, that's a good fire because mm -hmm. there was only low intensity fire. And I think what Dick Hutto and his you know speaking to in his research um, is uh, and also the work that Monica and, and I and, and and many of our, our colleagues have done is that um, is that we need to rethink what a good fire is, you know, uh, big fires that have a mix of low, moderate and high intensity. That's a good fire um, because we have a deficit of fire in our forests relative to the levels that occurred uh, prior to fire suppression for many thousands of years. And so, you know, oftentimes, you know, for example, um, there was a, a you know, there's, we see this again and again in big fires. We see biodiversity typically go up um, if these areas are not post fire logged. Uh, Monica mentioned uh, spotted owls, you know, so um, one of the uh, examples I talk about in my book, Smokescreen, is the Horseshoe 2 fire that burned, uh, I believe that was 2011 in southern Arizona. And uh, there's there a lot of Mexican spotted owl territories in that fire. It was a 223,000 acre fire, big one. And um, it had a mix of low, moderate, and high intensity, significant amount of high intensity fire, uh, but mostly low, moderate, which is natural. And uh, but significant high intensity and people thought, well, this is this is really worrisome. We're going to lose a lot of Mexican spotted owls. But the thing is, it was mostly in protected forests, So there was no post fire logging within three years after that fire. Mexican spotted owl populations had doubled. And the reason was, is that the snag forest habitat created by those patches of high intensity fire 
uh, is incredibly good habitat for the small mammals that the spotted owl preys upon. Mm -hmm. And so the snag forests have small mammal prey biomass that's two to six times higher than the unburned old forests. So the spotted owls are nesting and roosting in the lightly burned areas mm -hmm. that are still mostly big old live trees because they like that for nesting and roosting. But they're flying over ridges and over valleys to get to that snag forest habitat because that's where they're getting a lot of their food. And Monica and I call that the bed and breakfast effect. Yeah. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> exactly. And if I can just jump in again. Um, so another great quote from Dick Hutto is that plants and animals talk. All we need to do is listen. And what he's saying is that if we just watch mm. them and we study them and we understand you know, how they use their habitat, how they respond to fire in these different ways, they're telling us about their long evolutionary history with fire. And if there are so many species that do really well and not only just kind of tolerate fire, but actually some of them require it. For example, I'm going to start with like the original the original pyrophile, which is the longhorn beetles. Okay, so these there's a couple different kinds and they have special sensory organs that can either sense smoke or heat. And they're the first ones to get to a fire. And they, they basically, um, they lay their eggs, they, they, they land on the dead trees that are freshly, freshly dead. So the trees still have sapwood inside them that is food for their larvae, but the trees are dead so they can't pitch the, the beetles out. So the beetles lay their eggs on the trees, the, the eggs hatch, the larvae bury in there, and then they are big, fat, like inch long larvae. And they're in there for a couple of years, you have larvae inside these trees and that's what draws the woodpeckers, especially the blackback woodpeckers. So you, you know, they're, the, the first pyrophile is, are those beetles that are like sensing smoke and fire and okay, this is our habitat, this is what we need. They get there, the blackback uh, woodpeckers come, forage for years on these amazing, like, like they're like little steaks or uh, you know, tofu if you're a vegetarian, but like something delicious for them. And there's a super abundance of, of these this larva in all these trees and that's what draws in all these woodpeckers. Woodpeckers are creating holes, cavity nests. So they're not only eating the super abundance of larvae, but they're also making holes, um, cavity nests all over the forest. And then you have secondary cavity nesters that can't make their own like bluebirds and house wrens. And so that's primo real estate for those birds to be able to use the woodpecker holes after they're done. So you have a proliferation of these species doing really well. You have uh, flowers and shrubs coming back and it's bringing in all these insects. So you have these aerial insectivore birds and bats that are in there and it's just bursting with life. And so again, you know, these plants and animals are telling us something. They do great. They, some of them need and require this kind of habitat. That tells us that these big burned patches are completely natural in the forest. They're as natural in our forest as the rain or the snow. I love hearing the story of, of ecological pioneers. Um, just because all ecosystems have the pioneering, they're these successional stages. So it's it's great to see. Well, the fire, the fire restores that habitat for them. It's not like we have to restore the forest because it burned. It's like the fire actually was the restorative agent for these species. Yeah. 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 I want to return to something that, that you touched on, Chad, about good and bad fires. And I've been thinking a bunch about anytime you, you read in the media these days, and I get irked with the media about this, they use the words catastrophic and disastrous to describe fire behavior. I'm curious to hear, you know, with the exception of loss of life and structures, which are obviously tragic, is there ever a time when those words like catastrophic or disastrous are appropriate to describe fire behavior? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, you know, and I talk about this a lot in, in the smokescreen book, you know, where, where we have a deficit of fire, which is in our forests, uh, both in the Western US and the Eastern US and almost every forest in the world that has a natural fire regime. Um, most forests have a deficit of fire. There are some exceptions. Uh, globally. But there are some equally. And so basically in forests, when we have fires, even big fires, because we know we've always had big fires, there's, there's lots of evidence of that. We had fires historically that were hundreds of thousands of acres in size, millions of acres in size. That's natural too. And so when, when that occurs, it's a restorative event because we need more of it. Um, if we had too much fire in our forests, then you could start talking about ecological impacts that were adverse. And let me just give an example. Um, Montane, I mean, sorry, not Montane, a foothill, Chaparral in Southern California. Um, the kind of 
shrub ecosystems that are below the forest in elevation, they actually have too much fire. And mostly it's because of human ignitions, uh, because they're close to large population centers. And you just have a lot of people in fire season you know, doing dumb things that cause accidental um, ignitions. So those, those ecosystems have too much fire. And oftentimes what ha what's happening is they burn again before they can mature and reproduce. And so it's causing conversion uh, into, uh, from chaparral into grasslands in some cases. So we don't want more fire there. We actually do want less and we want to curb and stop those unplanned human ignitions. And so there, you know, you could, I wouldn't use the word catastrophic because I just try to get away from, you know, kind of value laden words, but I would say it's a negative effect there because even though fire is natural in chaparral, we actually do have too much. In our forests, it's the opposite. Um, uh, let me just give one example of a, of a circumstance where uh, it's been widely reported as a catastrophic thing. We had a, a big fire last year uh, in numerous uh, giant sequoia groves in the southern Sierra Nevada on Sequoia National Forest called the Castle Fire, about 183,000 acres. Bur burned through numerous groves. Um, most of them had not burned in a very long time, in many cases over a century. And, um, and, and people said, oh my gosh, that's a catastrophe. And there was a recent a new story released saying that uh, about 10% of the mature giant sequoias um, had been killed in the fire. Uh, and, and, and people are saying that, you know, again, cat catastrophe. Well, a couple of things to know there. Uh, first of all, uh, the estimate of 10% mortality is based on satellite imagery. And the folks who put that imagery, that, that estimate together have not visited the groves <laughs> and uh, are not aware of the fact that giant sequoias uh, produce new green foliage from surviving terminal buds uh, more than any other conifer on the planet. And so uh, even when they look dead, they're not. They'll just produce new foliage the next year. Some will be killed in the fire, but it's most likely much less than what they estimated. But the thing is, is that for giant sequoias to effectively reproduce, you have to have fire of moderate and high intensity. They don't really reproduce very well in low intensity fire. They're serotonous. Their cones need that heat to release the seeds. You need the heat to consume the thick duff and litter on the forest floor and basically create a, a, a nutrient rich bed of mineral ash to allow germination. And so in other words, for millions and millions of years, unless you have a fire that's intense enough to kill at least some giant sequoias, it's not intense enough to perpetuate the species and allow reproduction. It's a cycle of life in a giant sequoia forest ecosystem. And uh, you know, one giant sequoia snag is like an ecosystem unto itself for dozens of cavity nesting species every single year for centuries. So. I look at the castle fire and I say, uh, it's the best thing to happen to those groves uh, in, in over a century. I wanna to get to a, a, a participant question in a moment, but I just love the concept of serotony. Um, it's a beautiful word as well. I wonder if Monica, you could just for a half a minute, add your voice to, to that concept because it speaks to the essential role of, of intense fires. Yeah, again, I mean, these serotonous cones of these conifers wouldn't exist if it wasn't for a very, very long millions of year history with high severity fire. Um, so yeah, and they and they're found, these types of cones are found in different ecosystems across the West, different forests across the West. Great, so here's a question. This one's from Jerry Black, and then we're gonna pivot the conversation after that, after this. How does drought affect restoration? And by that, I think he means the, the natural um, rebirth of, of forest and trees. I noticed uh, in the Jemez Mountains of New Mexico, very little regrowth. You, Chad, you wanna take that? Sure, yeah. So, so it's interesting. I've spent um, uh, quite a bit of time in the biggest fire in, in recent years in, in the Jemez Mountains, which is the Los Conscious Fire of 2011. And I pay particular attention to the largest high intensity fire patch in that fire, which is in kind of the southern central portion of the fire. And um, what I found are a couple of things. Uh, first of all, the areas that are barren are areas that were post fire logged, mostly by close to roads. And uh, there was a fair amount of post fire logging in that fire, unfortunately, near roads. And um, and where the, where the post fire logging happened, uh, it, the, the, it did damage the soil. It uh, killed the natural regeneration of the forest. And, uh, and uh, when the, the Forest Service planted conifer seedlings, a lot of them have died. In the natural region, in the areas that burned at high intensity where there has been no post-fire logging or planting, 
uh, what I've found is a, a incredibly abundant and vigorous regeneration. Aspen, gamble oak, and the conifers are already starting to come in. It's natural for them to come in, you know, start coming in at eight or nine or 10 years post fire in uh, the dry forests of the Southwest, uh, the conifers, but you get um, an initial really vigorous growth of, of, uh, of aspen and, um, and gamble oak. Um, yeah, this is a picture right here just showing the, um, the aspen regeneration, the natural aspen regeneration is already more than half the pre-fire height. And that's just at 10 years post-fire, um, not even 10 years post-fire. It's just remarkable. And, um, and where you have the, the, and of course you've got conifer seedlings um, coming in already. Uh, I, I sent along some pictures uh, uh, along those lines as well that uh, perhaps we can show later. But um, the point is, is that um, there's really vigorous and, and wonderful natural regeneration of the forest going on, even in that largest high intensity fire patch and less conscious fire. Um, and there's dozens of little pockets of surviving trees scattered throughout that patch as well. I'm seeing that in every single large high intensity fire patch I've ever researched in the West. That's great. Thanks uh, for, for that explanation, Chad. So we wanted to start this conversation by really celebrating the dynamic and restorative role of fire and really even challenge some of our, just the, the perception that is driven in the, in the media and by agencies about fire. I want to pivot the conversation, spend the next 15 minutes or so talking about the narrative and the dimensions of, of that flow from it, that wildfire is a disaster and it's always a disaster. Um, and I think, and I want to reassure the audience here, we're going to get to your questions. We'll spend the last 10 minutes on questions. I see the chat box blowing up with questions. So we'll get to some. Um, but let's start with kind of the, the political and cultural pressure, pressures that influence the agency um, in terms of how they respond to, to wildfire. And um, you want to start, Monica, just give, provide the context for what the agencies are responding to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think because it's still such a, um, really the dominant paradigm still is the good fire, bad fire paradigm, which is that the big severe fires are the bad fires that we, we need to stop. And we can try to stop this through um, lighting prescribed fires and then also doing thinning in the forest. And I think this is, a, this is one of the myths we need to bust here tonight or today. Um, yeah, so that's the, still the pervasive dominant paradigm. And um, unfortunately, underneath it all, it's really supported by, you know, and it's driven by economics because the Forest Service makes most of its money on timber sales through, you know, these days with these post-fire salvage logging sales or thinning green trees in the name of preventing fire. And so a lot of it is really, you know, the, the underlying dynamics are um, for financial purposes. And I also have to say that I, I think Part of the problem as well in being able to kind of change the paradigm to one of, you know, not good fire, bad fire, but that bad fire is when it burns down your home or your community, but it's not when it burns out in the forest miles away from a community. It's actually good and restorative for many, many species. And I think part of the problem is sometimes our own brains can't even wrap our heads around that idea. Uh, you know, and especially I think some, some people who maybe work for the agencies where for so long they have believed and it's kind of this entrenched belief that these fires are bad, that um, being uh, presented with data to the contrary, their brains just aren't necessarily accepting. And I, it's interesting because I think there's a lot of psychological studies that actually bear this out that sometimes people kind of dig their heels in even to a prior belief, even when they're faced with data to the contrary, because it's really almost part of their identity now, you know, smoky bear, fire's bad. Um, and, and so it's like they kind of dig their heels in and sort of believe their prior beliefs even more than ever. And that's, this is something that we have to overcome to be able to change that paradigm and to embrace the necessary, uh, you know, the, the, the beauty and the importance, critical ecological importance of these fires. Yeah, we've seen that what that psychological dynamic you've described on climate issues and the way in which people's pre-existing beliefs reinforce, tend to reinforce their worldviews, notwithstanding the facts. Yeah. Chad, yeah. you've you've had a, a long career in these issues. Could you just speak to like 
the political and cultural context in which the wildfire as disaster narrative, like what the implications of that narrative are. Yeah. I think you know Monica said something I think is profoundly important, you know, in terms of the you know the good fire, bad fire, and and what really is the catastrophe. You know, we we need to rethink how we view wildfires out in the forest, but it's very different when a fire affects a community. Uh, so, for example, you know, one, an issue that I talk about, an example I talk about a lot, is uh, the campfire of, two, of 2018 that devastated the town of Paradise in the northern Sierra Nevada. Uh, a lot of people don't realize, you know, that fire, which was ultimately 150,000 acres in size, most of the area that it ultimately burned through was uh, forest that, you know, hadn't been really managed in the past. It had very little logging history or no logging history. That fire was overwhelmingly low and moderate intensity, but... The first six hours of that fire, it burned through some of the most heavily logged forest in the entire Sierra Nevada on both national forest land and private timberland. Uh, there was a fire that burned 10 years earlier called the Butte Complex that had been heavily post-fire logged uh, on public lands and private lands, a lot of commercial thinning as well, uh, across these thousands and thousands of acres that just happened to be right between the point of origin and the town of Paradise. And the fire burned across those logged areas faster than anywhere else that it burned in the entire fire. I mean, far faster. Uh, and it moved about three miles an hour across those logged areas, whereas in the rest of the fire, it crept at just a tiny fraction of one mile per hour. What that meant was people had very little time to evacuate. And, uh, and the fire reached that town very, very quickly. 85 people lost their lives, in part because of that pre-fire logging. Of course, it was hot, dry, windy conditions. So the fire was going to reach the town no matter what, because the wind was blowing at that direction. But it wouldn't have got there as quickly. And, um, and in addition, 14, 000, over 14,000 homes were lost. The reason for that is that the, the town, the people in the town were told by the Forest Service, by the logging industry in the years prior to the fire, that those logging projects were fuel reduction. Removing the dead trees was fuel reduction. Removing the forests were overgrown, they said, uh, so they were gonna remove a bunch of live trees and that would reduce fuel and create open park-like forest conditions. And that would save them from fire. And people thought, well, those logging projects out there over the ridge, they'll save us. I don't need to put on that fire resistant roofing. I don't need to put those, spend $300 at Home Depot and put on modern ember proof vents to keep those flaming embers from being driven by the winds into my old attic vent. Um, I don't need to get the dry pine needles and leaves out of my rain gutters and put on rain gutter guards. I don't need to do defensible space pruning within 100 feet of my home. People didn't do that. And the consequences were, were absolutely tragic. And that was catastrophic from a human impact standpoint. But the fire itself, uh, people don't talk about this, but outside of that, that several thousand acres that was heavily logged, the fire was a, a classic mixed intensity fire, if anything, at the low end on the intensity scale. Isn't that amazing? Did you want to jump in, Monica? No, I mean. OK, that, I, got another, <laughs> I, I got another question here that, that relates to this. Um, the Forest Service is telling the American public that we need to not only fight fires, but the way to, to address this is to log our forests. And again, this is something that, that really irks me. Um, and there's a Forest Service re researcher by the name of Jack Cohen, um, who either came up with this quote or I saw it in a story. And it's this simple, we can't fireproof our forests but we can fireproof our homes and our communities. And I think, you know, the Forest Service is doing something quite destructive by propagating this misinf misinformation and myth um, and that, as you said, is, is basically they're, they're responsible for the loss of lives by not saying the only thing we should be doing is to protect homes and communities. And we need to devote instead of the billions of dollars that they're devoted, I'm sorry, I'm on a little rant here and I said I wouldn't do this. Go for it. So, no, just- Three, what, 100%. What your, yeah. yeah, I mean, what are your thoughts about how, maybe how we confront these myths and get more and more communities to embrace that we must fireproof our communities because we can't fireproof our forests. Yeah, I mean, when you look at so many of these um, measures proposed by federal agencies and, 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 and bills in Congress, so much of it is to continually pour money into doing these logging projects out in remote areas as if that's what's going to help with this fire situation. And the fire by fire situation, I mean, people's homes burning, 
and you know the, the catastrophic effect in a community in a home. And so it's really just diverting much needed money. There's, you know, it's, it's not limitless money that we have. It's diverting money that we absolutely could use that to absolutely effective measures to home hardening and protecting communities, um, having a compu uh, community emergency plans to leave, but also, you know, hardening your homes and your uh, areas around the town. And the thing that I like about this message we're all talking about today is it's a really positive one. It's like, Let's focus our attention on protecting our homes and communities, and then we can celebrate when it burns out in the forest because it's creating this great habitat for so many species. So it's it's like it's like a freeing feeling almost. And um, yeah, and I agree a hundred percent. I just think it's it's very 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 damaging on the part of the Forest Service and, and members of Congress when they try to say the solution is logging out in the forest. It absolutely isn't, and people are going to die unless we unless we you know focus our attention back on what works to help people. Chad, what would you add? I mean, I think Monica said it really well. I'll just add a couple of things. You know, there's there's really good research that's been done by you know Dr. Cohen, who you mentioned, also uh, Dr. Alexandra Seifert and her colleagues. They've kind of written the book on this issue about how you protect homes and communities from wildfire. And, and what uh, you know, Dr. Seifert, for example, has found, and Dr. Cohen's research resonates with this, is that beyond a hundred feet from homes, there's no additional benefit to vegetation management. Yeah, none. And so it's really about the home itself and, and within uh, and 60 feet or sometimes as much as 100 feet from the home. And it's not about cutting mature trees. It's about limbing up the lower limbs and removing dry grasses and twigs and, and some seedlings and, uh, and, and things like that. It's pruning, basically. It's light touch pruning. You need to do it every single year. That's what defensible space is. And then making the home fire safe, what we call home hardening. There's a, a few key things that need to be done. Ember proof vents, rain gutter guards, get those dry pine needles and, and, and leaves off the roof every, every uh, fire season. Simple things. When those things are done, and we have numerous examples, I talk about a lot of them in, in my smokescreen book. When those things are done, uh, what we're seeing is frequently over 95% of homes will survive, even in most, the most intense fire. And we're seeing numerous examples now where 99% or more of the homes will survive. And so we know this is effective. What we're seeing right now are proposals from Congress. Uh, we're seeing it in California as well at the state legislature to do what they're calling the all of the above approach because they know they have to pay lip service to community protection. But what they're doing generally is allocating about two or 3% of the funding um, that they're proposing to home hardening and community protection from wildfires. And then 97, 98% of the wildfire funding is just basically to increase logging out in the forest. So here's the problem. Again, it's not helping it's not stopping weather-driven and climate-driven fires because weather and climate are the main factors that drive forest fires, of course. But also there's a growing body of research that's showing that in most cases, logging, including commercial thinning, makes fires burn hotter and faster yeah. most of the time, oftentimes toward towns. So you can always find, the fires are highly variable. You can always find a stand where a, a logged area or a thinned area burned at low intensity. You know, I can show people dozens of examples like that. And the forest service and the logging industry have been, you know, you finding those examples and highlighting them in a misleading fashion, fashion for many years. But what people need to understand is those are the exceptions, not the rules. Um, I'm doing research on the big 2020 fires and I'm finding the same thing. The thinned areas burned a lot more intensely uh, most of the time than the unthinned areas. Isn't that interesting? It makes me think of the prevailing wisdom amongst the aid, some of this old school state wildlife and agencies around carnivores and predators was you just got to kill them. And what we're learning is the more you kill, the more you're actually creating problems by the social disruption. That's right. And, and to me, that sounds like exactly what you're saying that, you know, they're saying that they're solving the problem, but in fact, everything is indicating that what they're doing is is worsening the problem. So okay. I actually want to get to some questions from the audience because we've got a bunch of thoughtful ones and we've only got 15 more minutes. So this one's from Patty McClelland and just either one of you jump in when, when you hear it. So I live on the front range in Colorado. We are aware of the climate crisis. Are you suggesting as we watch our state burn that it is all natural or okay? 
Uh, I'd be happy to jump in first. I'm sure Monica's got thoughts. Uh, yes, uh, that, that's, you know, ecologically, we do not have an excess of fire in Colorado. Um, we, uh, we still have a deficit, although Colorado is closer than some states uh, to natural pre-suppression levels. So, you know, as long as we're, we're within the natural range of variability, um, then, uh, you know, we shouldn't see fire as a disaster. And the same thing goes, by the way, for areas where we have, uh, you know, large patches of snag forest created by drought and native bark beetles. You know, these are native beetle species in many ways are the cornerstone of the entire ecosystem. And what we're finding is that the unburned snag forests um, created by drought and native bark beetles are similar in biodiversity to the burned snag forests, the ones that are created by high intensity fire. They're both incredibly ecologically rich. You know, I talk about this in the chapter two of my smokescreen book. Um, there's a lot of research on this. And so those areas in like Colorado's forests where you have you know, significant uh, stands of snag forest uh, created by drought and bark beetles, those areas are ecological treasures too. And um, Interestingly, the science is showing that uh, forests with uh, a lot of dead trees also do not burn more intensely. In fact, they often burn less intensely. Uh, same thing with really dense forests. Um, uh, they burn less intensely most of the time. So you know, really much of what we've heard about forests and fire is just incorrect uh, based on the most recent research. Yeah, and I, I might also add too that if we um, even step further back in time, you know, we're sort of talking here a bit about um, maybe the last hundred years or so. And Chad, you mentioned that we actually have a deficit of fire in a lot of our forests. Um, if you look at some of the research that's been done um, looking way back in time, there was a, a study in 2004 in the journal, published in the journal Nature, Pierce et al., where they actually looked back over 8,000 years in, in Idaho, in, the, in, the, um, in Yellowstone Park and also in Idaho. And they basically mapped um, or, or they just quantified uh, the amount of fire going back all that time. And there was far more fire in the forests in these areas than there was presently. Um, especially about a thousand years ago, there was something called the medieval climactic anomaly. And there was just an order of magnitude more fire, um, more big fires and just more fires all across the landscape. So yeah, I mean, I agree with Chad. I, this, it's entirely natural to have this happen and it's really tracks with climate. Fascinating. Yeah. I, I still wanna honor some of the emotional dissonance around the experience of fire and the displacement that occurs, even as the ecological story is, um, uh, is, is also true. So just trying to honor the, yeah. uh, the questioners uh, underlying kind of emotional experience. A couple more questions. This one is from Doug Conwell. I live in the Santa Fe area and have seen them, uh, thin live trees for managing fires, but it looks like they take out all these cut trees, leaving very little on the ground. And then bad erosion occurs when and if we get rain. What is the best practice with this? So could you speak to that very, like if you're gonna thin, I think that's a specific question about, do you, should you leave the trees there? Well, I would, I would say don't do the thinning project in the first place. It's, it's not necessary. I mean, the whole premise behind it is thinning is gonna stop high intensity fire from occurring and somehow it's gonna prevent high intensity fire. I mean, first of all, that's misplaced because high intensity fire is natural in these ecosystems. It's a natural component of these fire regimes and a lot of species depend on it. But second, it usually doesn't reduce fire intensity. So it's not accomplishing the fire management purpose. I would say really you know, focus on protecting homes, but don't do the thinning project in the first place. I'd much rather have that conversation than talk about you know, how to reduce impacts of thinning. Great. But that said, it's very important to have uh, woody debris on the forest floor to prevent erosion. Absolutely. Not uh, aside from the logging thing, but now, you, yeah, you're seeing that it's, it's very important to have those elements on the on the forest floor yeah. there. They're, they really do hold in water and um, and are a very important part of forest health. Yeah, I agree. And just real quickly, you know, it, it's actually really important um, uh, wildlife habitat as well, those down logs. Yeah. Um, but just to um, just to underscore, you know, the commenter is absolutely right. You know, those those thinned areas oftentimes do uh, uh, have a lot of erosion because of all the ground disturbance from the logging machinery. And um, and the winds will often whip through those areas and drive the flames more rapidly because you don't have as many trees to buffer the winds and actually act as a as a as a fire as a um, a windbreak in, a, in essence. Denser stands of forest act as a windbreak against the winds that drive the flames. 
They also have a cooler, more moist microclimate because they have higher canopy cover. And so there's so many countervailing factors that, that, uh, that make uh, fires burn differently than we would assume, you know, just based on our intuitive sense of things. Um, but I think your point, John, is absolutely right. You know, we, we, want, to be, uh, we want to be mindful of the emotional impact uh, to, to, to people of areas that they know well, and if they have you know, burned intensely, or if there's been a drought and, and a lot of the trees have, have died because of, of drought and native bark beetles. It is a real change and it can be shocking to people. And I, you know, I went through this myself. You know, I, I used to look at that before I started researching this over 20 years ago, I used to look at those areas and I, 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 was, I was really upset. You know, I, I, I love forests and I would think, oh my God, that's loss, that's devastation. Yeah. I thought the same thing. And as I started to learn more, my aesthetic uh, reaction to these areas completely changed. Now I look at it and I think, oh, that's wonderful. That's beautiful because I know the life that it brings. Yeah, I'm going to get to a comment because this, this will allow me to riff off of this. But this one's from Damon Hansen. He says, I've seen, or she, I've seen similar aspen growth after big fires on the north rim of the Grand Canyon this May. And I just want to say, and then we'll get to another question, that one of the things that um, about fire is people love aspens. And the only reason aspens exist <laughs> is because of the displacement of the forest that preceded them. Aspen have this intrinsic relationship to fire. So I think for everyone, especially in Colorado, where there are higher, higher elevation forests that are being burned, know that in, by the end of the summer, hopefully there'll be aspen shoots in many of these places coming up. So that's just my reassurance. Here's another question from Paul Hughes. Last week, I hiked the southwest area of the Carson Iceberg Wilderness in the Sierras, entering from the county line trailhead. Along the drive in, in there were miles and miles of salvage logged forests. What, if any, are the regulatory limits to salvage logging, acreage limits, subject to administrative appeal, or are all salvage projects treated as emergency and expedited with little or no environmental review? Just briefly, because I want to get to a couple more yeah. questions. Short, short answer is it's the latter. You know, so pretty much whatever environmental protections for trees and limits on logging or size of logging or clear cutting anything that might exist in the forest plans on a given national forest, on forest plan after forest plan and region after region, uh, those limits are basically waived after fire. It's a real problem. The public is generally cut out of the process in terms of comments and, and you know, uh, objection, any kind of administrative you know, reviewer or process. Um, scientific uh, analysis is short circuited. And so often a lot of this is done through categorical exclusions and the public is cut out. It's a real, it's a real problem. And so you'll see those sorts of massive post-fire logging projects oftentimes with very limited uh, public participation or environmental analysis. We need to change that. In my view, we need to get the US Forest Service out of the, the logging business, um, both with regard to commercial thinning and, and post-fire logging. And we really need to protect these forests, you know, much more like national parks. Yeah, to, to echo Dick Hutto again, these severely burned forests are some of the last places we should be logging, yeah. given yeah. that their levels of biodiversity are you know, equal to if not greater than old growth forests. They need, they yep. deserve the same protection. Yeah, we'll get to maybe two or three more questions. This one's from Karen Weber. Can you please address the increasing movement of building and living in wilderness areas, i.e. the urban wildlife, urban wildland interface? Mm -hmm. Is that also really an issue here in terms of good fire and bad fire? You wanna take that first, Monica? Uh, I mean, yes, that's that's definitely something that we need to address because more and more people are moving into the urban wildlife interface, and it's that's definitely um, a, a big challenge to you know these fire issues. So, I mean, maybe Chad wants to answer that a little bit more. It's not necessarily my area of expertise, but mm -hmm. well, one thing I'll say just briefly um, is that um, we we know that there are ways to build homes that are far, far more fire safe. We can also retrofit existing homes. I mean, frankly, we should stop building homes out of wood. We need to shift away from wood anyway uh, for, for climate change mitigation. But, um, but there are also additional things. It's not just about whether the home burns. It's also about whether people and their animals get out safely if they need to evacuate, if there's a fire nearby. And there are certain places that are just intrinsically risky, you know, on narrow ridges where there's only one point of one route of ingress and egress. You know, we shouldn't be building communities there because it's just inherently 
risky. It's, you know, windswept, uh, topographically inaccessible, really difficult to get in or out. Um, there are a number of places like that. And I, I, I've commented on new building proposals for huge developments in certain areas like that, that I, th I think are just uh, putting people in harm's way. And, um, and I think that we should, we need Oh, you froze, Chad. Uh, hopefully we'll get him back momentarily. Um, I'm gonna ask another question. And when Chad returns, hopefully it'll be seamless here. Um, this one is from uh, Adam Risson. Uh, he says, some, some proponents of active forest management assert there is a need to thin stands before conducting prescribed burns. Are there areas or circumstances where such an approach is scientifically sound? Um, I actually, from what I understand of the research, you get the same um, benefits of from not thinning before prescribed burn compared with, oh, we completely lost chat, it looks like, um, as well as doing the prescribed burning. Um, again, this isn't really my area of expertise. I'm more wildlife focused, so I could probably answer questions about wildlife and wildlife responses to fire. So maybe Chad would be better at this. Yep. Um, yeah, so maybe we can wait on sure. that one and try to answer. Mm -hmm. Sure, I saw a question earlier that I'm looking for about um, spotted owls. So oh, he, okay. here it is. Great. <laughs> um, it, in the wake of last year's um, massive bighorn fire, this one's from Patrick Deal in the Santa Catalina Mountains, just north of Tucson, Mexican spotted owl recovery is an issue. According to a major meta-analysis done in 2018, mixed intensity fires have a net positive effect, you spoke to this, for spotted owl populations, partly because the owls like to forage in burned areas. The local ranger district is using a 2012 owl recovery plan, which seems based on the assumption of a net negative effect from fires on spotted owls. What's your opinion on this issue? Mm -hmm, yeah, we need to we need, need to use the updated science. Absolutely. So um, there's no question about it. And, uh, you know, we have lots of, of proposed um, suggestions that we make about what you can do certain areas around spotted owl centers site centers that you would refrain from logging in. Um, and what we found actually in the Sierra Nevada in our um, when we were doing our radio telemetry studies, and then this is borne out by um, other studies that have been done after hours is that when that habitat is closer to the nest sort of core nest roost areas, that's when they really like to use it. And so we sort of recommend about um, maybe two kilometers out from the core area that you refrain from salvage logging. And this we think is, um, is something that could uh, really benefit spotted owls if we put those protections in place. So yeah. I think, yeah, not, not to worry. And I think it's also important, you know, to go out there and do the monitoring and, and continue to do the science to see how spotted owls are responding to fires of different intensities in different parts of the country. Yeah. You know, it's, um, I've dealt with this issue here in the Southwest um, because Guardians had a long history of advocating for Mexican spotted owls. And it's, yeah. it's amazing how the agencies weaponize and demonize fire to perpetrate the myths that are that are hostile to fire. Good to have you back, Chad. Hi, Chad. Thank we, you. Yeah, I got cut off there for a couple of minutes. Sorry about that. That's okay. We've got just uh, another minute or two. I, I maybe ask each of you to close with a thought about where does the fire debate go from here? And related to that, what's what's the one thing you think people should do? Um, just in the broadest scope of things to, um, to help change the debate and the trajectory of how we as humanity relate to fire. You wanna go I first, Pat? You first. <laughs> well, first of all, I think now we've all attended this webinar and hopefully we can all um, go out and visit some burned forest ourselves and see for ourselves. And we can um, it, it have that personal experience in the burn forest to really understand how amazing they are. And then you can tell other people, talk about it, encourage other people to go out and see for themselves as well. And I, I think one of the, the things we can do as a society is to, to just let the forest grow. It's called proforestation. It's something that's gaining some traction. Let the forest grow and then you'll have enough of the forest 
that it can burn in different patches, different mosaics, and you could have across the whole landscape, some areas that burn severely, some that burned 10 years ago, some that haven't burned in a long time. And all of this is going to provide for all the biodiversity that's natural and native in our forests. So that would be my suggestion. <laughs> Thank you, Monica. Yeah. Chad, closing words. Uh, I just add a couple of things, just a couple of little pointers. You know, I, I agree with Monica, you know, get out into the snag forest and, and check it out. A couple of things, you know, spring is really good time. Spring and early summer, it's a great time to do it. Uh, I would recommend going in the early morning or, or just after the sun goes down. Uh, most of the birds really kind of hunker down um, after kind of mid morning and uh, in the heat of the day uh, in the late spring and summer. Um, and, uh, and obviously, you know, make sure you're not in an area that was post fire logged, you know, look for those stumps. If, if it was, you're not going to get the same biodiversity. It's usually pretty, pretty desolate in those logged areas. Um, and I would say this, you know, I think, you know, from a larger policy perspective, we really need to start shifting away from, uh, from wood products, uh, for lumber, for biomass, you know, that's a really bad idea from a climate change perspective, as well as biodiversity. You know, it was a letter from over 200 climate scientists and ecologists to Congress last year that said we really need to start shifting away from wood consumption in the way that we're shifting away from fossil fuels in order to overcome the climate crisis, because we have to draw down that excess CO2 from the atmosphere. And the only effective way to do that is, in addition to moving away from fossil fuels, is uh, protecting a lot more natural habitats and especially uh, uh, carbon rich uh, habitats like forests. Beautiful. Got to protect our national forests for their biodiversity values and for their values in, in solving the climate crisis and storing carbon. Yep. And this thank you, been... Wild Earth Guardians, for being one of the organizations that does that. Yes, thank you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you Monica, and thank you, Chad. This has been lovely. I've learned some things, not only today, but in our preparatory call uh, recently. And uh, I just want to echo Monica's comment because Normally in these calls, we have an action alert where we're driving people to take action to influence Congress. And as we discussed what we really wanted people to do, we felt, uh, all of us, each of us, that we want people to go out and experience a burned forest and to change our relationship uh, one by one to the experience of burned forest. So I I want to echo that and uh, ask each of you to, to get out this summer and experience the joy of a burned forest. Yeah. Um, so thank you, Chad. Thank you, Monica. Thank, thank you, you for Monica. all the great questions from the audience. Uh, we'll do it again sometime soon. And uh, again, thank you, Chad and Monica. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.